People are literally, in the day in which we live, being canceled for having friends who do not yet know Jesus. How will we ever be able to bring friends to God if the only people we know are already friends with God? A Christian with no unsaved friends is like a farmer who never sets foot in the field. The father looked at the son and said, I created him to be your best friend. But in order to be best friends with him forever, you have to die for him. And Jesus, not counting everything he walked away from, looked back at the Father and said, done. Do I want to go through it all? Do I wish you would take the cup away from me? Yes, I wish you'd take it away. I don't want to go through it, but I will because I'm going to be best friends with him for eternity. If you got a Bible, if you would, turn to two spots. You can open up to John chapter 15, put a marker in 2 Corinthians 5. We'll start in John 15, we'll end in 2 Corinthians 5. We are wrapping up our series on the seven mandates, which we started at the beginning of the year. And I told you at the beginning of this series that every time we went through a week on the mandates, we would go through all the mandates that we've been through so far. So I know it's been a couple weeks, but let's try and refresh our memories, all right? Starting with mandate number one. What is mandate number one? We must be a presence-driven church. Mandate number two. We must be a historically generous church. Love it. Mandate number three. We must be a caring church. Mandate number four. We must be a feeding church. Mandate number five. We must be a developing church. Good. There was a little bit of a question on that one. Mandate number six. It must be ascending church, which leads us to mandate number seven, and it is the only mandate of the seven which is personalized to you. Now, you could really make the case you are the church, so they're all personalized to you, but the reason I, I made sure this mandate was extremely personal to you is because this mandate it would be easy for you to go, well, that's the church's responsibility, not mine. And so I'm making sure you understand this mandate is your responsibility, all right? Here's mandate number seven. We must bring more friends to our friend. We must bring our friend a whole bunch more friends. We're talking about evangelism. And since I know that many of us kind of play the, well, there are five offices in the church and evangelist is one of them and I'm not an evangelist, so that's not what I do. Here's what you need to understand. Bringing friends to God is not what evangelists do. It's what God's friends do, okay? So I'm gonna give you several things to understand, but I, I, I wanna calibrate your heart as we step into this conversation. The number one opportunity on the earth, in my opinion, is the opportunity to be friends with the God of the universe. The number one compliment of heaven is when God himself calls you his friend. But the number one responsibility in this life is God asking you to bring him more friends. Let me say it like this. The number one responsibility of a friend of God is not to get closer to God. That's actually the opportunity. The responsibility of a friend of God is to bring more friends to God. Three things we have to understand, and let me just say, uh, with the changes as we prepare for a third Sunday service uh, and we're moving from 11 to 1045, one of the things that has to change is the amount of time which I use to preach on the weekend. And essentially, since college, I've been going about 42 to 45 minutes plus ministry time. And now I'm going to have to go around 35 minutes. And I just, I, I need you to cut me some slack over the next couple of weeks as I get used to this, all right? It's gonna be a little clunky, and sometimes you're gonna walk away going, I feel like that sermon was missing something. It's because it was. I had to rip something out so that I could get to 35 minutes so that y'all aren't fighting in the parking lot when we have a changeover between the 1045 and the 1230. So cut your boy a little bit of slack for the next couple of weeks, all right? 
Okay, point number one. If we're going to bring God more friends, this, this point is going to shock you. Point number one. Well, we must be friends. Now, we did a, a series, most of 2023, I spent doing a series entitled Friend of God. So I'm not gonna recover all of that. If you wanna go back and listen to that because you missed it, go back and listen to Friend of God, especially the first five, six, seven weeks. Uh, but one of the things I helped us understand is not every child of God is a friend of God. Salvation through Christ does not guarantee friendship with God. Receiving Jesus as Savior makes us children of God. That's John 1. But pursuing Jesus as friend is what makes us friends of God. We, it, it's a pursuit, not just something we receive. Salvation is through Christ. Friendship with God is through Christ. But we must pursue Christ as friend in order to be friends of God. Some people, when I teach this, that not every child of God is a friend of God, they kind of push back theologically and go, well, I totally disagree. That's totally fine. It's your right to do so. But let me give you an example in scripture of someone who was a child of God, but nowhere near a friend of God, the thief on the cross. Remember that day? One of the two thieves being crucified at the same time as Jesus. This is Preston's paraphrase. Looks over at Jesus and goes, I get it. I didn't get it this whole time you've been running around ministering, but I get it now. And I want to receive what you are doing for me right now in this moment. And what does Jesus say to him? Surely, certainly, today, you will be with me in paradise. Question. Was the thief saved when he died? Was he a child of God? Yes. Was he a friend of God? No. Here's how you know. He didn't leave himself enough time to become friends. When was the last time you became a friend with someone in a single conversation? See, to me, this is the best example to help remind us it is not a guarantee as a child of God to automatically be a friend of God. Coming to church doesn't make you a friend of God. Pursuing God Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday three times, Thursday. A child of God is not automatically a friend of God. All right? In order to bring God more friends, we have to be friends. Very quickly, let me give you two sides of this coin where people get off into the ditch when we talk about friendship with God. First, when, when people overemphasize friendship and minimize kingship. If you're in John 15, and this is actually for my reform friends who get scared every time I talk about being friends with God and they go, Preston, you're teaching Jesus is my homeboy. No, I'm actually not. Jesus is my king, but he's also my best friend. Both can be true. And if I had more than 35 minutes, I would tell you why, but I don't have more than 35 minutes, so I can't. I'll have to find another time. John 15, verse 14, Jesus actually addresses those who overemphasize friendship while minimizing kingship. Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command. Look, you see relationship and kingship. Preston, you're my friend if you do what I say. That's what servants of the king do, whatever he asks for. Long before Jesus was your friend, he was king. He is king. He will always be king. The other side of the coin is those who overemphasize kingship and minimize friendship. This is for my friends who sweetly have a very high view of God and a very low view of themselves. 
And so they say, someone like me can't be friends with a God like that. Jesus actually addresses this in the very next verse of John 15. Verse 15, Jesus says, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. Jesus is king all the time. And Jesus and I can be friends anytime. But he is king before he is friend, but he is friend even as the king. If we're gonna bring God more friends, we must be his friends. Point number two, doing all right on time, a little bit better than last night, I'm feeling good. Still got five sub points to cover, so we better hurry up. Point number two, if we're gonna bring God more friends, we must understand how badly he wants more friends. A lot of different directions I could go here, but there are two things I wanna draw your attention to that Jesus did that I believe show us just how badly he wants more friends. Here's the first thing I wanna draw your attention to, his leaving. His leaving. I'm not talking about when he left the earth to go back to the Father. I'm talking about leaving the Father to come to earth and to live a perfect life and to die in our place on our behalf. What you're willing to leave for love shows how much you love what you love. John 17, if you're in John 15, you can turn the page. In verses four and five, Jesus says to the Father, Father, I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. What was the work the Father gave the Son to do? To do everything necessary to restore relationship between God and man, between man and God. That was the work. Son, do everything you must do so that we can get our friends back forever. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Listen to verse five. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. I wish I had time to sit in 17 verse five. To the best of my ability, which is very limited, to paint a picture to try and help you understand what it was Jesus left in order to come and do what he did for you. Let me try and paint the picture. All right, because during Friend of God series, I told you, I asked you a question. What was before anything which ever was, was? And here's the answer. Perfect love, perfectly loving, being perfectly loved. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, before one thing was created, everything was perfect and they were perfectly loving one another and being perfectly loved by the others. This is what Jesus is talking about in John 17, verse five. Father, I did everything you've asked me to do. I'm wrapping it up here now. Take me back to what we had before all of this even started. It was glory. It was perfect. Okay, let me try and paint this picture so that you understand what it was Jesus left to come be your friend. I want you to imagine that the God of the universe blessed you with trillions of dollars. Not only are you the first trillionaire on the earth, you're the only multi-trillionaire who will ever live. Anybody wanna sign up for that action? Okay, there's a catch. The father comes to you one day and he says, listen, I've created someone on the earth to be your best friend. The object of your affection. But in order to be friends with them, you've gotta leave the trillions. Okay, now I know I've been out skiing for, for a little bit and so maybe our church has changed while I was out, but hopefully we still don't lie up in here. I want truth tellers because liars go to the lake of fire. I was told that from a very early age. Scripture bears it out. Don't lie, okay? How many of us, by a show of hands, would be willing to walk away from 
trillions of dollars in order to have one friend. Would you please just put your hand up? Put it up very high and hold it up. Okay, everyone who doesn't have, keep it up. Everyone who doesn't, put it up high, please, here's why. Anyone who doesn't have their hand up and you need a friend, you need to find one of these people right here. <laughs> these are the amazing ones, my hand is not up. I'm just being real. If I had trillions of dollars, I could buy a few friends. <laughs> I'm not, I don't think, I, I, I don't think my wife would let me walk away from trillions of dollars for one of you. And yet, Jesus walked away from infinitely more than that to come be your friend. He had perfect best friends, Father and Holy Spirit. He didn't need any more friends. That's what's so awesome. Wow, he didn't need any more friends. He set his eyes on you and said, while I don't need another one, oh, there's one I want. And I've been thinking about her since before the beginning of time. And I know I'm going to have to leave infinitely more than trillions in wealth. But she's worth it. Take that. Stick it in your tailpipe. And worship on Easter weekend. His leaving, what he left, shows us how much he loves having friends. Second thing that I believe helps us understand just how badly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit want friends, not just wanted, but presently want friends, is his dying, Jesus dying. Not just his leaving, his dying. John 15, verse 13, one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. Jesus says, there is no greater love than to lay one's life down for his friends. Think about this for a sec. Let's go back to the scenario. So you walked away from trillions. Kudos to you. I couldn't have done it. But you walked away from trillions and now you have your best friend. And the father comes to you one day and says, there's one more catch. Not only did you have to walk away from all of that, If you want to be friends, and if you don't want your friend to die, you have to. In order to be friends with this person forever, you have to die now. Okay? Let's go back to the public raising of hands. Since, by and large, about 98% of us did not raise our hands, that we would not walk away from trillions. Those of us who raised our hands and said we walk away from trillions, how many of you would die to keep your friend? Would you put your hand up? That's awesome. Outside of my wife and kids, just being dead honest, I don't know that I would die for any of you. That doesn't make me bad. That's what puts in perspective what makes Jesus so great. Listen to me. The father looked at the son and said, I created him to be your best friend. But in order to be best friends with him forever, you have to die for him. And Jesus, not counting everything he walked away from, looked back at the father and said, done. Do I wanna go through it all? Do I wish you would take the cup away from me? Yes, I wish you'd take it away. I don't wanna go through it, but I will because I'm going to be best friends with him for eternity. Listen to me. If Jesus didn't want more friends, the minute he was confronted with dying for more friends, he would have left. 
and gone back to his best friends. But not only did he stay, he died. I believe his leaving and his dying show us. This is how badly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit want more friends. Which leads us to point number three. We're actually doing quite well today on time. I am incredibly encouraged by this. Point number three, and this is where it gets personal and practical for you. I know there's a laundry list of things I could have given you. But here's point number three. If we're going to bring more friends to God, we must know how to bring him friends. Three things I want to submit to you. Here's, before I give you the first of the three, how many of you have ever heard the verse, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother? Who's heard that before? Okay. Anybody know where it's from? What's that? Proverbs, absolutely. Chapter 18, verse 24. It's actually the second half of the verse, which I actually forgot what the first half of the verse is. Because we just walk around talking about Jesus going, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. His name is Jesus. Yes, he most certainly does. But you know what the first half of Proverbs 18, verse 24 says? Let me read it to you. A man who has friends must himself be friendly. Genius. If we're going to bring God more friends, the first thing we must understand about bringing him more friends is you need to be friendly. I know. I know what you're thinking. Preston, this is the deepest message you've preached in a long time. Let me try and and help you understand why this is so important and we can't just overlook this. It's going to be impossible to connect anyone to the friend if nobody wants to be your friend. Let me try and paint this picture. In my opinion, and this is a little bit of a pet peeve, I don't want to camp out here and, and seem judgmental. I just get really frustrated with this. To me, there are two types of patrons, Christian patrons at a restaurant. The first type looks like Jesus. The second type looks like Beelzebub. They're rude and entitled. The first camp is sweet and generous and almost serving their server. But the second type is immeasurably rude. Kind of sounds like this. Uh, uh, miss, ex- sir, excuse me, we need more waters. Question, is that how Jesus talked to the woman at the well? Is that the tone he used? Listen, you little unregenerate heathen of a woman. Bring me some water. I'm the king and I'm thirsty. Yet some of us go into restaurants all the time and act like they are there to serve us when the one we follow says, I didn't come to be served by the servers. I came to serve the servants. How will anyone ever listen to us about Jesus when we look nothing like him? You know, one of the reasons I think, and I'll I'll move on from this, but one of the reasons I actually think that so many of us are so rude at restaurants is because we aren't even thinking one second about bringing more friends to God. We're just stressed out. We're tired of being the low person on the totem pole at work, and so we go to a restaurant and it makes us feel we're in power, and so we treat people who seem beneath us like they're less than us. Good luck leading them to Jesus at the end of that meal. Let me say it like this. You cannot bring someone near to God when they want to be as far away as possible from you. 
That's Preston's paraphrase of Proverbs 18, 24. Second thing, and this one's going to shock some of you, and I, I do mean that literally, not sarcastically, and, and we'll walk it through. If we're going to bring more friends to God, we need to understand we need to have friends who are sinners. <gasps> and anyone who, and I'm, not, I'm honestly not making fun, because I think it's very sweet for people, for followers of Christ who say, I can't have friends who don't believe in Jesus. I actually think the, the birthplace of that typically isn't religious. It becomes religious, but the beginning of it is, I, I'm just following you, Jesus, and anybody that's following you, I'm running with them and they're running with me. It, it's not inherently wrong, it's just not helpful. And I want to show you a couple of passages about Jesus. But here, here's the reason I think some of us don't have any friends who are sinners, who are lost. It's because our parents, when we were nine years old, told us this one thing. You are who you run with. You are who you run with. Don't run with them because you'll become like them. Okay, that's what you tell a nine-year-old, not a 39-year-old. And if at 39, I still run the risk of being like everyone I come in contact with, that's not a them problem, that's a me problem. Let me show you just a couple of passages, all right, about your Jesus. Luke chapter seven, verse 34, Jesus was just talking about John the Baptist and everybody taking shots at him, and Jesus transitions to talking about himself, and he says, the son of man, on the other hand, feasts and drinks, and you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. Jesus was called a friend of sinners. Luke 5, verses 31 and 32. Jesus says, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Some of us saved people don't have unsaved friends because we either don't think God wants us to have them or we're afraid of what other saved people might think of us because of our unsaved friends. People are literally, in the day in which we live, being canceled for having friends who do not yet know Jesus. I know I'm the dumb one in the room, but can I just throw out a question? How will we ever be able to bring friends to God if the only people we know are already friends with God? Jesus wasn't doing what the sinners were doing. We know he lived a perfectly sinless life. But he was with them so consistently consistently enough that his enemies could create a narrative about him, that he was just like the ones he was running with. And you know what's amazing about Jesus? He could not have cared less about what everyone thought. One of the highlights of my life, not just for the first 45, 46 years, but it doesn't matter what happens for the rest of my life, is one human being that took 15 years for Holly and I to love on, sow seeds into, answer middle of the night drunk phone calls for, from. And 15 years later, after meeting this person, they gave their life to Jesus. Guy used to, when we started the church, used to show up and sit in the back row of the Scottsdale Center for the Performing Arts completely drunk at 9 a.m. And I loved it. Back then, uh, some of you, it doesn't matter, I'm just giving it for perspective. Back then, there was a guy attending our church named Carson Palmer, who at the time was the quarterback for the Cardinals. I know many of you are, are not Cardinals fans, uh, and so it doesn't matter to you, because there are only like eight Cardinals fans in the whole earth. Can't always be godly, you know what I'm saying? 
But Carson used to sit in the back row on the opposite side, and he would bounce before a lot of people realized he was there. He'd grab his kids and he'd go back home. And it was this funny picture for me when I would preach. 850 seat room, about 75 to 85 people. And Carson Palmer is sitting up in the top and Pat Collins is sitting up at the top on the opposite side. And I remember one day, this is just me, not one time did I ever talk to Carson Palmer, not because I tried to stay away from him. He's just a human to me. Anyone compared to Jesus is not impressive to me. It doesn't mean that I don't honor what they do. But listen to me, the little boy was more excited about the drunk heathen than he ever would be about the famous multimillionaire quarterback of one of the biggest losing teams in the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I need help. I need help, I need help, I need help. Because my team's probably gonna lose a lot this year. I'm sorry, I love you. I love you. I, I, I don't mean that. Bad boy. Here's the point. For years, I thought something was wrong with me and the enemy was picking on me, saying, Preston, a senior pastor shouldn't have friends like this. And there were days I actually believed it. Now, with hindsight, I look back. Of course, the enemy would try and stop me from being friends with the dead Lazarus. Because one of my favorite moments in the New Testament is a passage that says, it paints a picture of a table Jesus is eating at and it says, Lazarus was at the end of the table and many funneled into the room just to see the guy who was once dead. This is what it looks like to be, bring friends to God. It's not just once I was blind and now I see, I was dead. And now by the blood of Jesus, I now live. We have to have friends who do not yet know Jesus. This one-liner that the Lord dropped on me is, is about as filthy of a one-liner as I feel he's given me in a long time. A Christian with no unsaved friends is like a farmer who never sets foot in the field. That brings us to the third thing. If we're going to bring more friends to God, you need to talk to your friends about your friend. You can't hide it under a bushel. Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 and 11. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down to the earth. Watch verse 11. And they overcame, I love that it's past tense, they overcame him, the believers, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives unto death. One of the things we're going to do a better job of as a church is sharing our stories. If we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and See, a lot of us just think, oh, well, the blood overcomes all, so we good. He bled out, we win. As believers, we overcome the enemy on the earth by the blood of the lamb and by sharing our testimony of the faithfulness of God where we were once dead. But now not only do we get to live forever, we get to live forever as best friends with the God of the universe. As a part of this mandate, as, as I felt the Lord give this to me, I felt there was something specific he asked for and he called it 10,000 hooks. Remember Jesus uh, likened leading people to Christ like a fisherman. They're like fish and we're fishermen. Jesus would say to this, the disciples, I'll make you a fisher of men, okay? When he gave me this burden for bringing more friends to our friend, here's what I felt like he asked for. For during the rest of my time, Lord willing, that will be just less than 25 years now, if he'll allow me that, that over the next 
24 plus years, that by the time I'm done with my lap as the senior pastor of this church, that we would put 10,000 hooks in the water so that fish can eat at any time, especially in the middle of the night when they are being bombarded by God's enemy. And so one of the things we're beginning to do, this is a part of being a developing church, we're gonna help you tell your story and we're gonna record it. And we're going to search engine optimize it to where whatever it is that God has been faithful in your life through. So for my friend, it was alcohol. Guy was a raging alcoholic for decades. Gave his life to Christ, hasn't had a drop of alcohol in a decade. Literally God set him free. Well, he's gonna tell his story. And the picture the Lord gave me was some inebriated human being in the middle of the night who is done with it all. Lost their marriage, lost their kids. They get online and Google, I'm done drinking. And by the grace of God, God enables us to make sure the first link that pops up is a link to a six minute testimony from our friend speaking directly into the camera to that person in the middle of the night saying, I've been where you are and I know you're done, but I know you don't know what to do next. Let me tell you a story. And then at the end of the story, there are two paths. If the person on the other end knows Jesus, it goes this way. If they don't know Jesus, it goes this way. In a couple of weeks, we're actually going to have a how to tell your story workshop. And I'd be thrilled if the bulk of our church showed up. If you want information, just take a picture of the QR code on the seat in front of you. It's in a couple of weeks, I think at the third week of April. Uh, and we're going to get you ready to put your hook in the water. Can you imagine while you're sleeping six months from now, without even realizing it, someone in Rwanda is searching online? nibbles on your hook and comes to Christ. What about 20 years from now when you've forgotten you even recorded it? Listen, this is war and Jesus is coming again soon. And part of our job is to equip the church to do the work of the church. And one of the highest responsibilities of the church is to bring friends to God. This is not for the evangelists. This is for the friends of God. That brings us to 2 Corinthians 5 and we'll be done. I want you to just to see a picture of how important this work is. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Jesus did the work of reconciliation but the children of God have been given the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Now listen to verse 20. We are therefore, in other words, because we've gotten a revelation that the God of the universe gave the work of reconciliation to the son, the son completed it, and now instead of giving the ministry of reconciliation to the son or the spirit, the ministry of reconciliation has been given to the children of God. And because we've gotten a revelation of this, listen to verse 20, we are therefore, because of this, we realize we are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The God of the universe takes the ministry he has given you to bring him friends as importantly and as seriously as the Father takes what he sent the Son to do for you. The question is, do you and I take the ministry of reconciliation as seriously 
as Jesus took the work of reconciliation. The number one responsibility in this life as a friend of God is to bring more Lazarus to the feet of Jesus. I hope you were blessed by this message and I truly hope you heard the Lord speaking to you through it. Before you go, make sure you hit the subscribe button and tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new message is posted. And make sure to leave us a comment below sharing what God spoke to you and how he used this message in your life. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you next time.